Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our good friend Sam Clement and back from a vacation across the pond, the one, the only Courtney Trush. Y'all say hello. How's it going? Hey, John. Hey, guys. You know, this past weekend, as y'all know, I was down in a town called Dothan, Alabama for the wedding of a friend of ours. And, you know, some of the things we do is lovely, fantastic. Absolutely love seeing him look so happy, his bride so happy. It was a great event. However, on Saturday, uh, Beth and I got up. We felt a little groggy, still tired from the night before. Stayed up, just didn't get our sleep or something along those lines. And we went to uh, the local botanical gardens. Perfectly lovely, perfectly lovely and all that stuff. However, the place could have done with maybe four or five guys with backpack blowers a few times a week. Uh, Just enough little sort of like, hey, we're the hourly workers here that ordinarily do some of the raking, do some of the weeding and do some of the blowing didn't seem to be that there. And then we, right after that, we went to lunch at a place that shall remain nameless, and the same sort of thing. I mean, it's just, the, the, the wait staff was perfectly pleasant, but not terribly well-trained and sort of in short supply. And here I was, I was thinking about it going, what's going on? Here in Dothan, Alabama, I came back yesterday, took a look at the unemployment rates for all of the metro areas in the state of Alabama, as one does, Courtney. Yes, oh, and you know, in our free time. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out that the unemployment rate in Dothan, Alabama is 1.8%. So for all intents and purposes, if you want a job, you have a job. And perhaps it's not through no fault of the botanical gardens at all that perhaps they do need an edger. They do need things to be blown. There just aren't enough people out there doing it. Yeah. And then when I take a look at really hourly workers around the entire economy, according to the St. Louis, St. Louis Fed's website, we're talking about during the COVID, a lot of the hourly workers just all of a sudden seem to evaporate from the workforce. Yeah. And so I was also interested when Courtney came back, she said, listen, the UK economy's in the tank. No one's real happy, but there was there were help wanted signs in every restaurant and store we seem to pass. Where are, so I've got to ask a question. It's not just in Dothan, Alabama. It's throughout the entire United States. It's even across the Atlantic Ocean in the United Kingdom. I dare say it's around the entire world. Where have all the hourly workers gone? Well, uh, I think they've gone several places, and I think the most optimistic one you can tell is that a lot of people shifted up kind of the, the ladder, the, the labor market ladder. Well, you, you know, people went from hourly jobs into full-time jobs into you know, maybe even different career paths with the explosive growth that our economy had really in, in towards the back half of 2020 and 2021. There was a lot of new hires going on and a lot of people willing to, you know, bypass resumes uh, and any job history to get a full time job and get out of the hourly market. So I think you've seen a lot of that, among other things. Well, and, you know, from my experience, first of all, I just want to clarify, I did not say the economy of the UK. That's was what you said. I do not recall saying that. So I just want to clarify. But I do think John. That's what I heard. Yeah. You're over here safe and sound. MI6 is not going to come get you. It's in the tanks. <laughs> Everyone knows no. it. Well, um, when I was over across the pond, my sister, um, her boyfriend, is from England, and he made a comment. He said, "Well, it's because of Brexit that that we're seeing all of these, um, you know, help wanted signs." And I mean, we saw them both in um, London and then also in Scotland when we were there. And you know, I just. I, I never had noticed it before. And probably if I would have seen one or two, you know, I would have not even thought about it. But, John, it was just the sheer number. It was like every other shop. And it wasn't just, like, the bigger company. It was the small businesses, Mm -hmm. too. And you wonder if we can't get that level workforce. And whether Sam's right or not about people moving up, or is it that in a big city you can't live off of an hourly job? I mean, it's just astronomical, just the cost of living in general. I don't know about that. About the cost of living? <laughs> Just trying to throw Courtney off a little bit, coming back off of a vacation. Courtney, you're absolutely right. It's, I mean, right now, hourly work with the way things are, with rents and just utility bills, particularly in the United Kingdom, as you said, which is having such difficult economic times. And with the inflation, <laughs> rate, that, with the inflation rates with the inflation rates that are over there, no, it is difficult to do that. Especially in London. Yeah, with, without yeah. a doubt, as, as Courtney said, it's very expensive to live in London and uh, difficult economic times and, and all that. Um, so when you take a look at those jobs no longer sort of being there, or at least the workers there, where have they gone? And I'm thinking to myself, I think they've gone a lot of places. As you mentioned, people were just kind of moving up. And then also people got real used to flexibility. 
you know, real used to working remotely. They got a taste of it during COVID. And what you're seeing is a lot of mom and pops don't have the flexibility to have their right. workforce be flexible, to, yep. to be remote. No, you got to be you got to be in the shop. I'm already short staff as it is. And so you're seeing a lot of these smaller employers uh, really struggle trying to find people to come in because they can't offer that flexibility yep. that maybe a larger and, employer and can. What, what we talked about that really when COVID first happened and people went remote in our, our new normal series talking about the supply and demand yeah. of labor markets yeah. and how it completely gets turned on its head when you can find a job anywhere in the country and really anywhere in the world by working remote. And so why would people that are making hourly money in an expensive city like London or really any city not look across the country, across, across the globe for a job that if pays just the same, but you're flexible, if not probably more money. I mean, it, it, it's so much easier to find a job that has flexibility, and so many people have, have demanded that even. You're seeing protests at pretty much every big company that's demanding people to come back to work, and so it's clearly become a priority for people, especially younger people, and their willingness to take uh, less pay has been, has been documented pretty well, um, how important that is for people to have that flexibility. Well, I definitely think, I mean, people with families or just in general that just have a different mindset of what they want their life to be like, um, you know, that's very enticing to them. But going back to, you know, Brexit and even thinking about the immigration laws that we've had here that have scared workers out of the United States, I mean, do you think that that has affected our ability to, you know, really populate that lower level of the hourly worker? Um, in the U.S. as well as in the U.K. I mean, an article that I saw said that hundreds of thousands of that, like, kind of lower-tier hourly worker um, jobs had been vacated because of Brexit. Well, I, I'm not as well-versed on Brexit and, and its uh, impact on lower-skilled or hourly workers as much as maybe you are, or, or God, I haven't read too much on it. I would say in the United States, I'd say up until recently, I'd say, yeah, some of the policies that we did have did dis- did deter some level of workers um, from coming to the United States, or at least uh, we saw kind of net zero migration for a number of years. However, we're seeing people come across the border now in, in droves. I mean, truthfully, it's uh, borders largely opened, and we're really, I, I don't know how many people have come across over the last couple of years. So these people would historically be there to take a lot of the unskilled, sort of under the table, sort of type type jobs, and yet we're still struggling to find people to do that type of work in a lot of areas. Dothan and Alabama, I think, is a perfect example of that. And I do go back to, what I think, what, what Sam said. You know, during, after COVID, a lot of people, particularly people over the age of 55, and I'm, I'm, I'm now in those ranks, Courtney, just, yeah, you know, just, just, barely, just, just, just barely, just barely, just barely, 55 plus, we've seen a massive decrease in the labor force participation rate amongst that age of worker. We haven't seen too much of a change amongst people your age. No, they're, they're at all-time highs. And so, so what you're seeing is all those older people who got who left, they're not coming back, and we're just not, as people have gone up and taken those positions, older people have, we're leaving jobs here at the bottom, and then we're just not enticing people to come in and take them. I think part of it is the flexibility. I think another part of it is that mom and pop just simply can't pay 20 bucks an hour. They simply can't pay $16 an hour or even what a Walmart or Target or someone like that is going to throw at their hourly workers. They just can't do it. They don't have the flexibility. The margins are already small. And so we're going to continue to see this very weird sort of, it's almost a dichotomy, where we have a massive number of job openings and very tepid economic activity. To that end right now, I mean, according to the ISM reports on business, the economy is not really growing. But, you know, you touched on something right there. I mean, you were talking about just the sheer population. And, um, you know, I cannot believe that y'all both last week talked about population um, and people not having babies without me, who's clearly contributing to the population of the United did, States. Did you listen to it ever since? <laughs> Someone sent it to me and said, I can't believe they did this without you. Um, so, anyways, um, yes, but... <laughs> That being said, John, <laughs> apparently, um, but, you know, thinking through, are there are there more jobs than there are people to fill them? I mean, to your point, it seems like that is the case, but I feel like what we're talking about is more of like people don't want those jobs. But is it also that the mom and pops, yeah, they can't pay, so they can't compete with this smaller group of people because you do have, you have all the baby boomers, like the tail end of the baby boomers leaving and people aren't 
having as many children. And so you're not having that additional workforce to come in and, and replace those jo- uh, those people. Well, you're right. And uh, from amongst, as Sam said, amongst 25 to, I think, 35, the, un- the labor force participation rate isn't really off, I mean, terribly much, but it is off at 16 to 24. And so we're not creating the incentives enough to get those people to come in. People are going to work, people are going to college, staying in college a little bit longer. Parents aren't kicking kids off the sofa to, to any to any in, to any form. And so that's where I think a lot of this gap is. And then also, you not you and I've talked about this plenty of times, Sam. I think the gig economy work is impacting yeah. some of the official employment yeah. numbers because. I mean, shoot, instead we saw of it this month, yeah, especially, I mean, instead of working for Burger King, let's say, having to be there behind the, the boiling grease and throwing fried potatoes in it um, and, you know, being beholden to the man for eight hours. Why don't I just get a job picking up stuff from Burger King and delivering it to people who are too lazy to go get it? Yeah. And I'm going to make the same amount of money and it's going to be on my time. And I am interested. And we talked about this after the most recent jobs report and we how weird it was with the establishment versus the household. Yeah. Not to get too far into the weeds, but really the biggest driver was those self-employed workers that yeah. dropped significantly and you think about maybe some people that are on the lower end of the earning spectrum that are deciding to maybe do something kind of small on their own it doesn't make a ton of money um, but it gives them that flexibility and then all of a sudden the economy starts to slow down and you know maybe that's not as viable of an option anymore and so I'm wondering if that is kind of the beginning of a trend and if we'll see those kind of uh, hourly jobs start to get filled a little more as that self-employed number maybe starts to come down a little bit. So, John, you talked about 16 to 24 age group is the ones that we aren't seeing entering the workforce. When when, when did you get your first job? When I was 15. When you were 15. Was it throwing papers? No, it was uh, fixing sandwiches. You worked at Subway? No. <laughs> I don't even think there was Subway right there. Oh. I worked at the Birmingham Country Club on the, oh, nice. uh, at the halfway house on the West Course. Oh, nice. Okay. And Sam, when I was did 16. You, you were 16. I was 16 well, I, as well. 16 was the age you were allowed to. Yeah. I, well, yeah. I'm not sure what the, lab, what the labor laws were in Alabama at the time. I was 15. I'm not and sure I turned, they had them back then. Well, they probably didn't. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's been so long ago. It's a, it, it was so weird living. They only the, had dirt roads back then in Alabama. It was so weird living the first 10 years of my life in black and white. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I turned I turned 16 three weeks after I got my first job, so yeah. there's probably a little wink wink or something like that. So, uh, so no, that's when that's when I got it. I mean, truthfully, oh, uh, and the numbers numbers do suggest that teenage employment is down. And and in truth, when you take a look at it, that's not all that surprising because that job now that we had and Scott worked with me for a little bit that summer. Uh, that job had always at the country club been filled by teenagers. Right. That job is now filled by grown ups. You go to the CVS, those jobs are largely filled by grown-ups now, whereas yep. the kids from Mountain Brook would just go in and take the jobs at Ariel's uh, Pharmacy or at Crestline Pharmacy or what have you. So a lot of those jobs that teenagers used to take, fast food joints, working at the country club, working at the pharmacy, all that stuff, now grown-ups are trying to make a living uh, doing those jobs. So there aren't as many employment, there have not been as many employment opportunities for that, for that age group up until really the last couple of years. And how do you force those people to do that type of work? One, frankly, the wages aren't that great. You give up flexibility, and frankly, it's not a lot of fun. Do you think there's less of a societal focus, at least in the U.S., yes. on kids in high school getting and a job? And the value yes. of them knowing how to work. Because for me, it was not really an option. It wasn't an option for it's, me either. You're going to find a job. Well, I mean, it was, a, it was an option for me. However, it wasn't an option because I, I didn't get an allowance. Yeah. If I wanted to, um, if I wanted to go out on a date... <laughs> Take the ladies out. If I want to hit the town. Take cruising. If I wanted to trip the light fantastic, I had to have some uh, I had to have some coins in my pocket. Oh. And, and then, you know, Pops uh, wasn't, wasn't throwing those things around if you catch my drift. And so I had to go get a go get a job. And what was interesting about that is I got three twenty five an hour plus tips. And the tips actually took my total compensation to like eight bucks an hour. Oh nice. Which back in 80. That was yeah. about what I got in my job in 70? college. When was it, John? What's the matter with you? 1984. Why don't you go back to England? <laughs> so in 1984, I was actually making more per week working two or three days a week than a lot of my friends who were working five days a week were. Yeah. But, you know, I'd see both sides about it, you know, becoming less important um, 
to be working when you're you're 16 years old. I'm not sure about this, but you know a lot of other countries that maybe have a higher focus on education um, for their youth. I'd be curious to see the data on, you know, some of the um, most well-educated countries and yeah, the job like or, or even a China South Korea. or you know these countries that have much higher importance on uh, educating their youth or at least do a better job of it than we do if they're working when they're 16 and 17, which I would guess it's less so. But they have year-round school. Like, I mean, in the UK... Because that's an important... Right, because it's an important focus. I mean, they they get a break, but it's not like three months like it is for us. Um, And they have, like, week breaks throughout, you know, so it's probably harder for them to have like a summer job whereas like I remember growing up a lot of people were lifeguards or you know I always had like a summer job and I remember my first job I tried to roll it into my junior year of high school and that was very quickly like I realized I couldn't balance having a job. And I worked throughout the whole year. Yeah I, I couldn't. School. I was not I mean I, but I was working at the the Galleria at the time and so I what were you doing I was I worked at Rack Room Shoes you worked at the Rack Room Shoes Rack Room Shoes was my first job and so you know you you had to stay open until 9 so by the time I got home after cleaning up the shop it would be like 9 30 10 o'clock I'm not about to do my homework because I had to get there like right when school like ended um for like my shift so it it just wasn't conducive to me being successful at school and so I realized I needed to quit and I ended up finding another job that was more like better suited for you know being a student um, which was Hoover Shipping. I don't know what that is. Um, It's like a UPS store and it was right across from that high school it's still there um, and it was perfect like it closed at six you know whatever so um, but I enjoyed having my freedom and a lot of my friends worked it was just kind of like you wanted to get out of the house. You wanted to be like important and having your own money and having a job and being able to buy something that I wanted or, you know, be, you know, go on trips with my friends and not having to ask like my parents for money. So what you're saying is kids these days. Yes. When it boil it all down, it's kids these days. It's parents that have children right now in college or that, just that finished are, college. That are letting them. That are just letting s- them not sit learn around, the value of play, work. Play Xbox. <laughs> you're tanning themselves on the on the, by the pool. Oh, that's so. That's what you're saying. The problem is in the United States yes, economy. Yes, parents. Parents. How about you? What about me? Well, I mean, here we have the millennial, the the woman with the basket I mean a minivan full of children that we didn't talk about population I, or population I know, control in terms of both <laughs> <laughs> last I think, month I think we're probably broadly failing on both sides of the spectrum on um, you know elevating the importance of education and a work ethic yes I would agree and I've got I, I, listen that, that's where we're not going to be trading perspectives on, on any of that uh, but if, I will tell you this it is going to be a problem for a lot of these smaller shopkeepers, if you will, and smaller restaurants and smaller franchisees, uh, both here in the United States and it seems as though they're seeing in the United Kingdom as well. Once people get a taste of flexibility, once that Pandora's box is open, it's very hard to close it. And bigger companies with the larger benefits uh, have greater ability to kind of either A, allow the flexibility or B, say, get your butt back to work than I'd say a lot of the smaller employers. And that's where I think we're probably seeing that huge gap uh, are those small there's some small, there's small small folks trying to find people. And by small, I mean employ up to 100 people or something like that. Uh, that That's where I think really the issue, the issue lies where they're at. Yeah, the well, tighter feels, margin. Yeah. Kind of and it feels, I guess, a little bit like a seesaw. You know, in the sense that for the last three months we've seen a decrease in the jobs report. Not, le- not last month. Not necessarily. Okay, I thought it was, it was, it was up. It was up uh, to, to 10.1 million again after yep. th- after three months of decline. Okay, so after three months of decline, mm-hmm. and then we saw an increase. So it was kind of like, okay, I guess, and maybe I'm like doomsday, but it was like, oh my gosh, like hold on to your seat and hope that you don't get let go because you want to make sure that you keep your job and you're not looking because it it drastically changed because to your point like there was it was the first time in my working life that people could really go out and get a job and get paid really well if they made a move to not having that opportunity you know in the last or I guess 30 90 days before um 
So, I mean, do you think that that's indicative of how it's going to be, or do you think it's more of looking at these lower paying jobs? Or I, I think up until about the last six months or so, I think it probably was a lot easier to kind of skip employers and get uh, a big increase. I don't think that that market's quite as tight as it was, and I really do think a lot of the job openings are for that hourly work. We yeah. still are not back to the employment levels where we were in leisure and hospitality before uh, before COVID and, and in some other sort of transportation and warehousing and some of the ones that people that really just frankly don't want to do, uh, but requires a body and uh, can't be all that flexible when the pallets need to be moved and all that. Uh, so those are the areas where you've seen a disproportionate number of job openings. Uh, you're not seeing it quite as much in you know, the legal field or you know, accountants or I even bankers. I feel like bankers. you've seen it in a lot of areas where you, you kind of need a warm body there. We're still seeing yeah. a decent yeah. bit of healthcare jobs. We're seeing a decent bit of construction jobs, even with a slowdown in those areas. That it's kind of hard to replace that. Well, and you can't you can't uh, unclog a pipe with an app. If right. you catch my drift, you still need to have someone not, come not do yet. it. Yeah. Well, not yet. You're absolutely right about that. So, so you know, for those types of jobs, we're still going to have a difficult time finding folks. And uh, I'm not sure if we really traded perspectives on anything like that. But I did find it interesting when Courtney came back and said that, hey, the same stuff's going on in the United Kingdom. You just kind of add two and two together, and our economies don't look all that different. Uh, in some ways, the United States and the United Kingdom. So it's not all that surprising that perhaps they're seeing a shortage of sort of that hourly and maybe arguably unskilled worker. They can blame Brexit. We can blame whatever we want to, previous immigration policy, parents and all that stuff. But I do think it ultimately comes back to how do you attract that hourly worker to come work at a job that's not terribly fun, doing work that's kind of grueling, uh, monotonous, and get them to come uh, when they can either not work at all or find black market economy or gig economy type work where they can work for themselves, have the flexibility that they want, and uh, probably make a little bit of money besides. So this is not going to be a problem that we solve here today, certainly. And I do think it's going to be an ongoing problem for larger employers to some degrees, but particularly for mom and pops and smaller employers. I agree. All right. Well, guys, we always love to hear from you all. So if you have any comments or questions, please, by all means, let us know. You can always drop us a line at tradingperspectives at oakworth.com, where you can leave us a review on the podcast outlet of your choice. Of course, if you're interested in reading more, hear more of what we have to say or what we think, you can always go to oakworth.com, take a look underneath the Thought Leadership tab, and find all kinds of exciting information, including links to previous episodes of Trading Perspectives, as well as links to our blog or newsletter, Common Sense. Y'all have any last words on this topic today? That's all I got. See you, John. That's all I've got today, too. Y'all take care.